Tableau One, in which Darwin's inheritance is considered. Darwin should always be a bearded and benign figure. Much like the figures of mythological and biblical authority, he has superseded. He should be like a Moses in a 19th century suit, come down from the mountain with new commandments. Darwin was born in 1809. Geographically and historically, in the very centre of the English Industrial Revolution. His grandfather was Erasmus Darwin, prophetic commentator on evolutionary theory and close friend and associate of many of the very first round of English scientific and industrial figures. These men were professional enough in trade and commerce, but their moral responsibilities always remained amateur ones. It was Charles Darwin's generation of natural scientists and philosophers, and Charles Darwin in particular, who were to take a responsibility for the moral and ethical thinking of the century. Only Erasmus Darwin, with excellent, if ironic, pragmatism, could form a scientific club and call it the Lunar Society, because it met on every night of a full moon, not on some hermetic preoccupation, but because that way, the horses could see to find their way home in the moonlight. Tableau 2, in which Darwin considers a career in medicine. Darwin's first experiment in education was to go to Edinburgh to study medicine. His grandfather and his brother had done the same before him. Edinburgh University was a liberal institution practicing highly empirical educational methods, unorthodox ideas concerning the mechanics of life and the universe, considered radical in English universities, were freely debated here with enthusiasm. In official medical studies, Darwin was not an ideal student. He could not develop a stomach for a dissection or surgery, for the necessary confrontation with blood and pain. He ran away in the middle of an operation on a child, and the memory of the event always haunted him. The enthusiasm for study in Edinburgh often went beyond the law. The insatiable demand for bodies for anatomical investigation led to resurrecting corpses from the common grave and, when these numbers did not suffice, then to murder.
The setting is always Darwin's study, a book-lined room with a large central desk. Darwin spent most of his working life behind such a desk. This is not an exact reproduction of Darwin's study, but an imaginary composite mid-19th century working place, which may reproduce, in essence, all the scholarly working places of mid- and late-19th century figures, like Darwin's actual near-contemporaries, Marx, Dickens, Ruskin, Prince Albert, Shaw, H. G. Wells, Tolstoy, and even Freud. By day and by night, there are a great many light sources in Darwin's study. Table lamps, candles, candelabras. Placed symmetrically in the wall behind the desk, there are shutters, dark green blinds, and three sets of curtains. The lamps and the windows have these various characteristics. To make the light changeable, to sympathetically suit the many moods and events in Darwin's life, as he opened up new vistas for himself, and for philosophical thoughts, and for us, Tableau 3, in which Darwin, like any other Victorian English gentleman, shoots anything that flies. Darwin abandoned medicine. His father sent him to Cambridge to become ordained and find a peaceful and harmless sinecure as a country parson, a normal placement for a not very bright second son. At Cambridge, his attendance to theological studies was not strong whilst waiting with some exasperation for a token or sign of a personal religious calling, he enjoyed himself. The observance of God and the observation of nature together began to create irreconcilable difficulties. The problems of who made what and when and how began to insinuate doubt in a mind that was preparing for a privileged quiet life on a private income, worshipping God. Darwin continued to shoot at every opportunity, convincing his father that he would spend his life being an idle sporting man. English natural historians have found no problem in this set of oppositions. Indeed, a concern for the environment is traditionally supported by recreating it as a space to hunt and kill endlessly. Tableau 4, in which some implications of the Industrial Revolution are considered. The Victorian industrialist wore a uniform. He could be recognized by his dark frock coat, his tall black stove pipe hat, his highly starched linen, his elaborate whiskers, and his flamboyant waistcoat jewelry. The industrialists of the second wave of the Industrial Revolution were free thinkers on matters of religion and were antipathetic to those who used Christianity to bolster the status quo. Since they had gained their wealth and status through their own efforts, they had small sympathy with inherited aristocratic privilege. Whilst it is true they still initiated and supported radical ideas in mechanical invention and scientific advance, they increasingly settled into positions of decreasing radicalism in politics. They wholeheartedly supported laissez-faire capitalism and expected it to yield unlimited progress as industrialization was extended throughout the economy. Having gained wealth, they expected to hang on to it. They had no time for the kind of radicalism that might now be called socialism. 
It is often said that by 1851, Britain produced half the iron in the world to build the railways and the ships to dominate the other half. It is true that by 1870, the United Kingdom's foreign trading income was four times as large as the United States and more than that of France, Germany and Italy put together. Soon the sun would never set on the British Empire. Large contingents of cheap labor would always be working somewhere on the earth for the greater good of the British industrialists. By the time of the opening of the Great Exhibition of 1851, that triumphant piece of advertisement of Britain's industrial prowess, the Industrial Revolution had completely conformed with the buoyant superiority of Victorianism. Few were prepared to resist the propaganda of its glory. Darwin's wife wept with joy at the prospect of Queen and country standing together under Paxton's Glass Conservatory roof in Hyde Park, singing the national anthem. The Times declared that it was the first time since the creation of the world that representatives of all its peoples have assembled and done a common act. Tennyson wrote that he had dipped into the future and seen that the heavens were filled with commerce in the Parliament of Men. When he came to publish his theories, Darwin's doctrine of the survival of the fittest could be effortlessly transformed in these men's minds to mean the survival of the best. And these industrialists, basked in their cathedrals of industry, considered themselves to be the best. Tableau 5, in which the effects of a new social order are considered. Industrial capitalism worked its way through the whole social structure of mid-19th century England and began to make great changes, not least in the huge movement of people from the country to the town, in new erosions of family and community life, and in many interlinked systems of exploitation. But to quote just one statistic from Mayhew's London Labour in the London Four, published in 1851, the year of the Great Exhibition, it has been proved that 400 individuals in London procured a livelihood by trepanning females from 11 to 15 years of age for the purposes of prostitution. Protestant Christianity of all denominations, rapidly proliferating and fragmenting under the strain, struggled to keep a hold on the spiritual health of the nation with orphanages, workhouses and charity institutions. But the developing sciences, both worthy and bogus, were overtaking them in the popular imagination. Physiognomy, that insisted that hereditary criminality was determined by the shape of an individual's skull, hydropathy, complex systems of water cure, which Darwin resorted to for easing his digestive problems, mesmerism, hypnotism, clairvoyance, cosmology, astrology, along with a grotesque proliferation of junk technology, that came with the new discoveries of steam heat, magnetism, and electricity. Attention to disease produced quackery and excessive demographic investigation, but also more and more methodical observation. The sick, the old, the diseased, children, and certainly for the very first time the mad, played here in various archetypal ways by actors, came under a new particular and even obsessive scrutiny. Tableau 6, in which social justice is considered.
Transportation to the colonies was served on those considered to have committed crimes serious enough to deserve more than a whipping, but not serious enough for a hanging. The sentences were generally handed out to the young and to first offenders to serve from 7 to 14 years, but the difficulties of making the long return and the poor prospects of a welcome back home meant all but a very few deportation sentences were for life. However, stories were not uncommon of men committing crimes to get transported, preferring to face the unknown hardships abroad than continuing to suffer the conditions at home. Until the 1820s, some 200 crimes, including blasphemy and heresy, carried the death penalty. A rationalization of the law in the 1830s halved the capital charges, but with the consequent huge rise in the prison population. In the whole of Queen Victoria's reign, there were some 15 million admissions to prison, into the machines for grinding rogues honest. Officially, human contact prisoner to prisoner was forbidden and in many jails, eye contact was prevented by forcing the prisoners to wear masked caps reconstructed here by a costume department. Slavery was abolished in England in 1807, but it was still extensively practiced by much of Europe and certainly the Americas, where Darwin witnessed the brutality at first hand and thanked God that he would never have to visit a slave country again. Only Britain made serious attempts to seize slave ships, where the inhuman conditions may have worsened, if that was possible, due to the trade being persecuted. Dysentery, smallpox, seasickness, brutality, and mass suicide overboard resulted in heavy losses on each trip. It was said the downwind stink of a slave ship could be smelt a mile away. Tableau 7 in which 19th century attitudes to the creation of the world are considered. The invested interest, church and state, in a status quo rested in established beliefs, none stronger than in the message of Genesis. God created the world in six days. He created Adam, and from Adam's spare rib, he created Eve. But Eve is also responsible for original sin, and through it, the sins of knowledge behind which church and state created their bulwark of power and spiritual blackmail. Even to the pretty mythologies of art and culture and all the sentiments of family life. Transgression of these fine myths and harsh laws is punishable by God, whose first manifestation of judicial retribution is the flood, a true interruption of all life cycles. But forgiveness is promised by the rainbow, God's declaration that there would be no more disastrous calamities. Here are all the themes of the evolution debate, creationism, disaster theory, God's magnificence. Was Darwin going to be only another Moses, adjusting holy authority to new circumstances, or was he going to replace God entirely? Tableau 8, in which pre-Darwinian evolutionary theory is considered. It is often thought that Darwin's theories were invented without precedence, that everyone believed more or less in the dark creationism of the Old Testament. 
to believe anything otherwise was inconceivable, because there was no remote candidate to light up a different point of view. But the debating positions had been slowly building up for 50 or more years. To satisfy the scientific community, Archbishop Usher had given Creation Day a date, 4004 BC. He was easy to discredit, but the dogmatic stance he represented was instructive. William Paley acknowledged that each creature on Earth was peculiarly and curiously adapted to its environment, but that this was another indication of God's omnipotence. Lamarck frightened everyone by suggesting that after the first living things had been produced by spontaneous generation, they had then progressed to develop themselves in a series of ever self-perpetuating complexities until man was achieved. Robert Grant could not believe in animal species being created separately as the Bible insists, and he was branded as a philosophical materialist, wishing to destroy the moral fiber of the state. He might have been sympathetically heard by another man working in the British Museum at the same time, a man writing a work called Das Kapital. Georges Cuvier had been slowly piecing together the outline of the fossil record from primitive fish to mammal, and asking the creationists to explain why there were so many extinct animals. The reply was that the creatures had perished in the flood, but such was the periodic destruction of extinct animals God must have devised many floods to destroy what he had created. William Buckland developed his catastrophe theory that established the modern periodic geological table. George Coombe, though a supporter of the discredited science of phrenology, argued that the physical structure of the brain was the source of all mental functions. Robert Chambers suggested that the expanding size of the brain in a succession of lower animals could inevitably lead to the production of the human mind, but he offered no plausible explanation how this could happen, other than by God's directive. Alfred Russell Wallace is traditionally Darwin's closest rival for the honors of discovering the mechanisms of evolutionary development. Familiar with the Malthusian views of population, he realized that if a species existed in various related forms in a given area, those the least adapted would probably perish. He sent these thoughts to the only man he knew of who could deal with them, Darwin. Thus were some of the major participating themes of the great evolution debate assembled. The central mythology of Genesis that supports the vested interests, the laissez-faire tyranny that always enslaves at least two-thirds of its community, the structures for suppression, victims to be protected from the knowledge that might encourage them to overthrow the status quo, and the natural scientists wary of breaking social codes but never completely satisfied the genesis is the only mechanism to explain life on Earth. Tableau 9, in which Darwin takes a journey around the world in HMS Beagle. Darwin's decision to be an English country parson was indefinitely postponed. The Beagle, about to depart on a world voyage to chart the coasts of South America, wanted a gentleman naturalist of intelligence and breeding to pass the long shipborne days as companion to its captain, Robert Fitzroy. Fitzroy was a God-fearing conservative. Much later he went mad and blamed himself for providing Darwin with the opportunity to overturn God and Christendom. The Beagle left Plymouth in the Christmas of 1831. Darwin found at once he was a poor sailor. They sailed to Brazil, where Darwin was ecstatic about his first view of the tropical rainforest. Then to Tierra del Fuego, where they disembarked three unhappy Fugians who had suffered the privileges of three years of civilization in England. Darwin collected fossils in Patagonia and witnessed the slaughter of the indigenous Indian, seeing genocide as an evolutionary example of territorial expansion amongst unequal rivals. They sailed to the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific, where Darwin saw the finches and tortoises that are claimed to have spurred his imagination into formulating the evolution mechanism. Then to Tahiti and New Zealand, across the Indian Ocean, to the Cape of Africa, 
and back to England by way of a second trip to the Brazilian coast. In the event, the voyage, planned to take three years, lasted five. It turned Darwin into an exemplary scientific thinker, whose every observation he made was pondered and developed into theory. From ideas of geological dynamics on experiencing an earthquake to inspired calculations as to the formation of coral islands from close examination of their flora and fauna. Tableau 10, in which Darwin considers some principles of evolution. Scientific examination of the world, in all its species variety, had primed the necessity for a theory of unity and development, a strategy to examine how all the clamorous cacophony of the animal kingdom fitted together. Darwin carefully assembled his own particular evolutionary arc with an order of species entirely different from that drawn up by Noah, and an order that certainly and crucially included those animals from the fossil record. Darwin acknowledges that the main mechanism for his theory came to him late in 1838. By then, he had convinced himself that in the struggle for existence, favorable varieties were tenderly preserved, unfavorable ones were tenderly destroyed, a mechanism imbued from Malthus through Thomas Paine and Adam Smith that supported the notion of the survival of the fittest. Through the simple and absolute mechanism, every species on Earth had been created. Where would this evolutionary theory lead? Certainly not, as far as Darwin was concerned, exclusively towards the formation of man. Darwin's Victorian contemporaries, with indeed many people still today, if at all persuaded to believe in the apparent chance mechanisms of an arbitrary creation system, were loath to believe there was no grand design. Even if they could agree to the evolutionary mechanism in principle, they still insisted in seeing God's hand guiding the evolutionary process until it manifests itself in its prime creation, Adam. And from Adam to the Victorian English gentleman. But standing alongside Adam did not make Darwin agree that they were both there as any part of any divine scheme. Tableau 11, in which Darwin arranges his domestic life. Darwin argued with himself whether or not he ought to get married. He made a list of the advantages and disadvantages, picturing a nice soft wife on a sofa with a big fire, against the possibility that marriage would waste a great deal of his studying time. In the end, he decided that a bachelor life would be arid and soulless, and his choice was his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. After a short courtship, with his father advising he should not delay if he planned to have children, they were married in St. Moore's Church in Shrewsbury in 1839.
Darwin was anxious to leave the wedding celebrations as soon as possible. The bride and groom toasted their own future happiness with a flask of mineral water on their way back to London in the train. Charles and Emma were both 30 years old and they had known one another all their lives. She could speak French, Italian and German and had taken piano lessons from Chopin. She was a devout Anglican Christian and a sincerely religious woman. Darwin's developing agnosticism was a constant anxiety to her, but they agreed early on in their marriage that the matter should not be a bone of contention between them. However, her scruples may have been responsible for Darwin's reluctance to publish his findings. Darwin had no cause for regret in making the right choice from his rather cold-blooded tables of advantages and disadvantages. Charles and Emma were happily married for over 40 years. And instead of being a cause of distraction from the studies of scientific matters, Emma's care of her husband certainly increased his potential for study. Tableau 12, in which Darwin's attitude to his children shaped his beliefs. In 1842, Emma and Charles Darwin settled in a country house paid for by his father, a down in Kent, some 16 miles by coach and train from London. Here Darwin could keep some contact with the scientific community and be free of the noise and pollution of the city and its current turbulence as the streets were alight with the political activity of the Chartist movement seeking social reform. The privileged Darwins lived here all their married life and kept a considerable household, recreated here by some 30 adults and 10 children at a simulated meeting to photograph the whole family, an impossibility for all the children were not alive at the same time. The last born Darwin child was Charles Waring, who died aged 18 months in 1858. The youngest surviving daughter was Henrietta, who later elected herself to be the family's official biographer. George became a mathematician and a professor of astronomy at Cambridge. And Annie, born in 1842, was Darwin's eldest daughter and favorite child. Horace became a designer and manufacturer of scientific instruments. Francis studied medicine and later became his father's secretary, editing the enormous Darwin correspondence and Leonard became a major in the Royal Engineers. Mary Eleanor died aged only three weeks. William, the eldest son, born in 1841, was the subject of a short paper that Darwin later published under the title The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, which is still highly praised by contemporary child psychologists. And Elizabeth, who remained a recluse all her life. Darwin had great love and regard for his children, but nonetheless observed them with a naturalist eye, watching their growth and early development with dispassionate enough interest to make detailed comparisons between them and the growth of the infants of apes and orangutans. One of the single most important events of his family life was undoubtedly the death of his eldest daughter, Annie. She was affectionate and considerate and liked to sit with her father while he worked. She contracted influenza and in a forlorn attempt to aid her recovery, Darwin took her for a cure to a health spa in the Malvern Hills. It is said by Darwin himself that Annie's death finally wiped away any belief he might have had in a god. Tableau 13, in which the effects of the contemporary political climate and social unrest influenced Darwin. Darwin was certainly aware that his theories had important and deep-reaching political and social implications. Evolutionary processes did not particularly support the continuing significance of an omnipotent god. To the unimaginative and the faint-hearted, no god meant no moral structure. Church and state, it was thought, were faulty. 
law based on church morals and state expedience would be eroded. Social unrest would proliferate. Everyone would finally realize that the biblical promise, last shall be first and the first shall be last, was false propaganda to keep the have-nots in their place. There was enough significant social unrest in England throughout Darwin's life for the establishment to constantly be on guard against social instability. Darwin had been a child at the time of the reactionary Peterloo massacres. In his Cambridge days, the blasphemy laws were rigorously invoked against atheism, and the resistance to the British Parliamentary Reform Bill parted families and communities. The Chartist riots seriously frightened the establishment and were one of the factors that persuaded Darwin to move his family out of London. The 1848 revolutions around Europe stiffened opposition to change, but did not dampen the constant energetic agitation for many social reformists to improve the conditions of all those peoples who did not benefit from the results of exploitative capitalism. Darwin, without doubt, was unsympathetic to the privileges the upper classes had given themselves, and he was certainly sensitive to extreme forms of human degradation like slavery. But he was also a law-abiding man of property and family. He had no intention of giving any legitimacy, if he could help it, to the extreme atheists and the would-be anarchists. Tableau 14, in which Darwin's persistent ill health is considered. Darwin was a sick man, and the last 40 years of his life, a day seldom passed without a serious abdominal pain or some sickness or headache troubling him. And the symptoms invariably occurred in association with intellectual work or some special excitement. The list of his symptoms is long. Boils, fainting fits, headaches, trembling of the hands, aching teeth and gums, arthritis, catarrh, palpitations, nausea, vomiting, flatulence, insomnia, and persistent chronic exhaustion. The ill health started in the period between Darwin's return from his world voyage in the Beagle and just before his marriage. Darwin noted in his Beagle diary that he was bitten and laid up for a week in Brazil by a blood-sucking insect, the Venchuca. And some specialists in tropical diseases suggest he'd been infected with Chagas disease, carried by a blood parasite of the Venchuca insect, that after a long incubatory period can invade the muscles of the heart, causing extreme exhaustion, lassitude, intestinal discomfort, and heart trouble. Some medical experts say Darwin's illnesses were due to the cumulative poisoning effect of self-administered arsenic. As a child and an adolescent, Darwin had suffered badly from facially disfiguring eczema. And against his father's professional advice, he had started treating himself at Cambridge with regular doses of arsenic. He had a bad attack of eczema when he was preparing to leave in the Beagle, 
and as a mature adult, the eczema on his face was sometimes so disfiguring that his friends claimed to barely recognize him. On examining the evidence of which, since Darwin was an obsessive diarist and correspondent, there's a great deal, many physicians believe Darwin's problems were essentially psychosomatic. The nervous disorder eczema symptoms being an important pointer, they believe Darwin's ill health was brought about by his anxieties concerning his revolutionary work and the displeasure and antagonism he knew would be heaped on him when and if his findings were made public. Emma Darwin was a patient nurse and she organised the large household at Down around her husband's bouts of sickness. He was grateful and said so and she knew that he relied on her. Darwin's mother had died when he was eight and he'd been brought up almost exclusively by his older sisters. Perhaps he prospered on the continuity of such close female attentions. Emma habitually read romantic novels to Darwin to fill the hours of his insomnia. In the library, Dorothea observed that he had newly arranged a row of his notebooks on a table. And now Charles freely bemoaned his lack of interest in good literature and clamoured for fiction with happy endings. Darwin had once prided himself on his ability at diagnostic skills when he'd assisted his father at Shrewsbury, and he always took a close personal interest in his own symptoms, which might provoke the accusation of hypochondria manipulated to blackmail his family, but there's never a suggestion of complaint from his wife and children that his symptoms were ever anything but genuine. His ill state of health had been mainly responsible for his decision to move out of London, to the peace and quiet of the country, and why, at various stages of his life, he had turned down appointments, such as the position of secretary to the Geological Society. However, despite making notes about time being lost, and sometimes having to restrict his writing to a few hours each day, he was always awake early and eager enough to continue the research. Darwin's state of health limited his freedom to travel, and although frequently visited by many of the leading naturalists of the day, who provided him with stimulation and answers to his queries, his research was essentially carried out at home. His house was full of natural history specimens sent to him from all over the world, and in the 1860s, to further his investigation into transmutation, Darwin took great pleasure in breeding domestic pigeons. He had their skeletons mounted to demonstrate the fundamental structural differences between the various breeds. Darwin hoped to persuade his audience of the correctness of his theories by demonstrating how species characteristics could be guided by selective breeding. If man could do this in a period of a few years, then how much more could nature accomplish in millions? Darwin was, however, at pains to point out that these domestic pigeons were selectively bred with fixed directives in mind. There was no such fixed plan in nature. Tableau 15, in which the publication of the origin of species is considered. Darwin's Origin of Species was published in November 1859, and the whole edition sold out on the same day. The reaction of the clergy, the majority of the scientific establishment, and all of the middle classes was immediate. The popular press excited its readership with ape theory. Darwin was pointed out as the most dangerous man in England. Bishop Wilberforce wanted to know whether Mr. Darwin preferred to be descended from the ape on his grandmother's or his grandfather's side. 
Opposition was incensed not directly by ideas that animal species were transmutable, these were exclusively scientific mysteries, but by the implications of the theory that made man no more than a talking ape and God irrelevant to his creation. Tableau 16, in which Darwin's theory of evolution is considered relevant to our present understanding of ourselves. Darwin's evolutionary theories have dramatically obliged us to look at our animal origins and our physical selves with new eyes. Our ideas of corporeality and sexuality have to be adjusted with new sympathies. Now that we are no more or no less than a naked ape, our connections with our animal heritage make us severely doubt notions of there being any purposes to our existence other than that we can ascribe to animals. And since Darwin's theory suggests the individual is the insignificant servicer of the species, then apparently the necessity to reproduce is essentially our only pertinent function. Our programmed sexuality is the prime motivation of our existence. Each individual is only a suitcase for carrying and passing on the genetical code. Post-Darwin, it is not easy to successfully make any other human action or behavior or achievement significant. In the light of this fact, we have been obliged to re-examine notions of the greater sensitivity to reconsider such dearly held concepts such as conscience, spirit, and the soul. Concepts which we pride ourselves on possessing to make us a superior animal, capable of communicating with even greater forms of intelligence, mortal or immortal. If we have not been able to ascribe our animal ancestors with these characteristics, how can we conceivably invent these characteristics for ourselves? The aims and ambitions that man has held important for so long, indeed which most of the past 2,000 years of Western civilization has been built upon, no longer have the same significance. There can be no validation for good and evil, no fixed model code, no sacrosanct states of model consciousness. There are no longer the same goals of moral perfection to aim for. The ethical imperatives that have seemed inviolate are now seen for what they are, Constructs for the subjective comfort for the given people at a given time. Man-made constructs, not any given or universal prerogatives. By the final use of his thinking, Darwin was sure that despite any heartfelt wish for the contrary, man was not the sum and end of the evolutionary process. And that, in every likelihood, Homo sapiens was, in evolutionary terms, no more than a link that would continue after him, and probably without relationship to him, since evolutionary progress had seen so many dead ends, cul-de-sacs, and abortive developments, especially in the highly developed species. Man could be described as a highly developed species. Tableau 17, in which Darwin's ideas have changed the significance of man. Galileo and Copernicus, physicists and astronomers, shifted the focus of man in his relationship to the universe. They made man lonelier than he thought himself to be. But despite the jolt to his self-esteem, it was still possible for man to accommodate his wishful belief in being safely embraced by God-made laws and conditions. Charles Darwin, a biologist, has committed no such condolences. The abstracted numbers and distances and wholly unbelievable notions of time presented by contemporary physics and astronomy for man to contemplate do not have the same degree of shocking immediacy as Darwin's proposition for his species. Darwin has given man such a short communicable history and such a long uncommunicable prologue that looking back is no comfort. Looking forward is no comfort either because evolution appears so directionless and so apparently purposeless. Darwin has finally put man 
irredeemably out on his own. Can the Darwin revolution have any more shocks for our self-esteem? It has made us a chance animal, never to be repeated. And since we've probably already planted the seeds of our own destruction in several different ways, then we've probably arrived at the time when the chances of our significantly evolving any further, especially on this planet, according to Darwinian strategies, is no longer possible. After Darwin, man is truly on his own. The props have fallen, or better still, the props are no longer necessary. Darwin has given us a freedom that no social or religious program has ever given us. For if man is on his own, then all the checks we relied on to excuse or explain our own shortcomings and mediocrities have been removed. We are, at least, now free for what we want to be. Tableau 18 in which Darwin, the atheist, is buried with honor in Westminster Abbey. It is a curious phenomenon that having created a workable structure to comprehend the complexities of creation on Earth, and presumably for everywhere in the universe, then that encyclopedic complexity of information begins to seriously erode. The data of the Galapagos Islands, the huge reserves of observational material available to Darwin in his trip around the world, are vanishing. No sooner have the classification systems been arranged and codified than the data is destroyed. Perhaps this is a mysterious corollary to knowledge. No sooner has man understood a thing than its essence crumbles. Perhaps that is what God tried to prevent when he worked so hard to deny man the tree of knowledge. <laughs>